There are two books in the Bible that they say do not preach from in church. One is in the Old and one is in the New. Revelation in the New Testament and Song of Solomon in the Old. But nothing that God has said should be left alone. Revelation chapter number one. Revelation chapter number one. I, I believe just kind of projecting how long uh, it's going to take to get through this book will actually be when Jesus comes back. I, that <laughs> Revelation chapter one. Can, can we do one thing? Can we stand as we read Revelation chapter number one? We're only going to read three verses. Revelation chapter number one. We're going to read them together, verses one through three. If you found it, would you say amen? amen. I want to preface this by saying that, again, I'm not preaching from this book because of any recent events or that Donald Trump got nicked in the ear and was somehow wounded dead two days and came back up again or something like that. It's not in response to any events that have happened, although my wife told me the way up here there was an earthquake, and I guess in Southern California on the way up over here to church. I've been waiting for some time to walk through this book together. Revelation chapter number one. Ready? Begin. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The scriptures literally say that we are blessed simply by reading the book of Revelation, by hearing the book of Revelation, and obeying the book of Revelation. What a disservice to stay away from such a great promise. Amen. And amen. Lord, bless this time tonight as we open up this living book of the living God. We praise you that the living Savior is at the right hand of the living God, ever living to make intercession for his people. How great thou art. How great is our God. Great is thy faithfulness. You are greatly to be praised. Guard us from distraction even now. Focus our hearts and our minds on your word. Spirit of the living God, be our comfort. Illuminate us, lead us, and guide us into truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. Uh, we'll kind of walk through this book with just a little bit of an introduction. And as we get into this, we'll begin to walk through this verse by verse over the next several weeks months, and perhaps a couple of decades. All right, number one, if you're taking notes tonight, the author is John. The author is John. John the Apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. Look at me in Revelation chapter 4, 1, excuse me, verse number 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And those are real churches, and we'll walk through this as we get to the book of Revelation. Throughout church history, the authorship by John has been questioned, uh, but should not be any more. Uh, a, a church father by the name of Arrhenius himself testified of John's authorship. Arrhenius claimed to have direct contact with John through a disciple and friend by the name of Polycarp. Who's heard of Polycarp? Okay, and the fish was named after him. 
Carp. Okay, Polycarp. Just checking you out tonight. Polycarp was a bishop and a pastor in the city of Smyrna, uh, and that today is in the, in the country of Turkey in a city called Izmir. It's still a still city there. You can still visit the ruins of these seven churches in the book of Revelation. John, as we know, writes the Gospel of John. He writes the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But we would certainly say that this would be the crowning glory, the revelation of Jesus Christ. John writes this while exiled to the Isle of Pat. Atmos. He was, we believe by tradition, the one apostle who was not killed or dying a martyr's death. He dies well up in his years, perhaps 90s, even up into his hundreds. We're really not sure. It is believed that he was freed from Patmos and was allowed to go back to Ephesus where he was a pastor, where he died and where his tomb and grave is to this day along with Mary, the mother of Jesus. If you remember, Jesus told John to take care of my mama on the cross. How many of you remember that right there? And John did that. Domitian dies and Trajan releases him. The interesting thing about the book of Revelation itself is that it's very clear that John wants you to know that he's the witness of these things. You'll see often this phrase, and I, John, saw. I, John, saw. In the Gospel of John, he identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That wasn't a taunt to the other disciples. How many of you understood Jesus loved the other disciples as well? It was a term of just being overjoyed by the fact that Jesus loved him. I think that's a pretty good thing to put on your dog tag or bumper sticker. Jesus loves me. Amen. What a truth to know. What a truth to know. So John the Apostle is the writer of this book. As we go through this book, there's really only two ways to interpret this book, two methods of interpretation. It's important that we get this right. I'm not going to bore you tonight with the word hermeneutics or historical grammatical context or some of those things there. Uh, when I was in college, I had to take classes on hermeneutics and apologetics. And I told you many times, I did not know what the word apologetics meant. It meant defending the faith. When they said, you have to take apologetics to be a preacher, I said, I'm not apologizing for anything. It's the word of God. And, and, and I didn't know what that word meant. I really didn't. I thought, what kind of place is this? Uh, but hermeneutics is the understanding and how to interpret scripture, how to interpret scripture. And there's really two ways that people interpret the book of Revelation. Number one is called allegorical. Allegorical. That believes and that in method of interpretation or viewing the scripture is is that everything in Revelation is a symbolism of just conflict between good and evil. Good and evil. And there are uh, Christians who hold this view. And I want to say this tonight. As we walk through the book of Revelation, there's a certain standpoint from which I teach this. Be charitable and be gracious. Better people than you have differing views. People who love Jesus just as much as you do have differing views. So be charitable and gracious. If over the last 2,000 years, Christians have still been figuring this out, you're probably, and I'm probably not the one to say, aha, I have it better than anybody else. Somebody say amen right there. I will say this, that while some believe it's a story of the conflict between paganism and Christianity, um, I, I am not an allegorical person. I'm not an allegorical person. There's just too much free form of interpretation and allegory. There's no way to check that. When the Bible says there's an allegory or there are allegories in Scripture, the Bible will tell us that. There are key words and there's metaphors and different things we'll see in Scripture as or like. And those tells us things and how to look at these things. When John says, I saw something like unto, he's never seen anything like that before. And he's trying to describe something in the future in which he's never seen. Good luck with that. Somebody say amen. But he's doing those things. So there's an allegorical view, which is basically the book of Revelation is just about the good versus evil story on the earth. The second way, and of course the correct one, uh, is what we call the literal view. Not there aren't phases of other views, but the bottom line is this. We believe the literal view understands that the events that happen in the book of Revelation are actual events. Those churches are actual churches. What happens in chapter 5 actually happens. Chapter 6 actually happens. All the way to the end when heaven comes down like a bride adorned and God dwells with men. 
We believe this to be an actual, literal event. Literal event. And so we, because we interpret Scripture literally, literally. So how can I tell if I'm a literal person or an allegorical person? If you believe that the millennial reign of Christ is an actual event where Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years, you would be a literal interpreter. If you believe that the millennial reign of Christ just speaks of some golden age of sweet time by and by, then you would be uh, allegorical and you would also have to prove that things are getting better and better. When Jesus says, and the Bible says, things are going to wax worse and worse. You'll find disagreements of the literal view of Revelation over the timing of the rapture of the church, over the timing of these events. We'll discuss those and walk through those, but there are two basic methods to interpret this. And I want to ask you to do me a favor. Uh, I would certainly be glad to answer any questions that you have. I would also like for us to be able as a church to walk through this book together. And then right after service, five of you get together and come up with 1,600 different things and then say, I don't, I think let's just give everybody a little bit of patience to walk through it. Can we do that? And, and he said, but you didn't talk about that in chapter three because we weren't there yet, but we'll get there. But let's be gracious there in those things. So two basic methods of interpretation, allegorical or literal. I am a literal by Bible interpreter. I'm wanting to grow in that. But I believe when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose from the dead. When God spoke the world into existence, he spoke the world into existence. There were six days of creation. There was an actual flood. That's not just an allegory of, uh, of, of things swelling over. I believe these things. I believe there was a real giant. I believe that Jesus, that God parted the waters. I do believe that Israel walked by on the Red Sea on dry ground. Literal from one end to the other. Why interpret literal? Because all of the prophecies about Jesus Christ coming the first time were fulfilled literally. Literally. To the T. So why would now we switch gears and say, ah, it's just a story. Somebody say amen. So literal, literal interpretation. There are four major views of Revelation relating to the time period that it covers. I'll try not to bore you with these things, but I think it's important. Four major views of Revelation relating to the time period that it covers. Number one, there's something called the preterist view or preterist view. People call it different things. Those who follow this view believe that their predictions as fulfilled during the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So what the, the predictions and prophecies in this scripture were fulfilled during the fall of the Roman Empire, the rise and fall of that with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. They would look back and say that when the church was under the pressures of imperial persecutions and all the prophecy in the Bible is actually history. And the preterists would believe that we are now in the kingdom slash millennium age, although it's too millennial, but still, that's what the preterists review, that the events and the prophecies that John saw have already happened and have not been fulfilled. The difficulty with that view is that Jesus hasn't come back yet, as far as I know. Amen? But how do we know? Because every eye will see him. There'll be no mistaking when Jesus comes. Amen. And there's some different things we can look through. There's what we call the historist viewpoint, where Bible prophecies are interpreted as representative of actual historical events and battles and different things like that. Uh, it would be a, basically that Bible prophecy is a sweeping history of church history from Pentecost to end times. It wouldn't necessarily have any future things to it. It's just kind of a historical part of what's going on. And uh, the things that uh, John preaches or John prophesies about and records are just metaphors for actual events, nations, or persons of history. This was especially popular during the Reformation when it was used to suggest that the Catholic Church was part of end times apostasy. And uh, many of you have been taught that. Uh, and I will take a different view with that as we get there. When will we get there? You have to come back every Sunday night to get there. The Pope was the Antichrist, like the Pope himself was the Antichrist. And, and they could sit there and it was this Pope was the Antichrist. And so... Um, Jesus still has not come back yet. So I do not believe those things were fulfilled during the time of the Reformation. Are you with me? Follow me right there, okay? Seven churches in Revelation 2, 3 are symbolic of seven ages of church history. Many of you have seen uh, charts that have seven different church ages. 
And uh, I'm not trying to step on any golden caps here, but I don't really mind to either because we're so messed up on so many things and, and things have crept into our churches that I quite frankly would say are unscriptural and not the right interpretation. And uh, this is just one man's viewpoint, but it is my viewpoint. But these seven church ages, you've got this age, the Laodicean age, and that age. How many of you say, okay, I've heard, I've heard at least of the seven church ages? Okay, how many of you are afraid I'm going to shoot at you as soon as you say that? I'm not going to do that. I didn't say completely support it. I just said, have you heard of it? I just want you, that came from a historist uh, viewpoint, and that was a way to explain revelation and what was going on. There's the idealist, which basically it was almost like the preacher's view that this is just a, an, a revelation is just a picture even of current time of just good versus evil, the struggle in life. There's one more viewpoint, and it's called the futurist viewpoint. Here's the basic premise of the futurist viewpoint, and I will go ahead and tell you that I'm a futurist. I believe that their events of revelation, particularly from chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book, are yet to be revealed and yet to happen, and yet to happen. The futurist believes that the majority of prophecies in Revelation await a future, a future literal fulfillment, a literal fulfillment. We believe that there will be a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We, we believe that Jesus will come in power and glory. We believe he'll actually come on clouds, the Bible says. That's in Daniel there. We're going we're gonna to dive into Daniel as well as we get into this and at the appropriate time and walk through and see what Jesus said about what Daniel said because what Daniel says is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. And so we would divide perhaps Revelation into, look with me in chapter 1 there, verse number 19. Chapter 1, verse number 19, where John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be here. After. So there is a past or a present and then a future event to all of this. And that is the four major views of the book of Revelation. And there are approximately 602 literally different ways to go at this. So here's the summary. The preterist would say when it comes to what period of time does Revelation cover, the preterist would say any time between A.D. 33, uh, A.D. 70, the destruction of Jerusalem, maybe all the way up to A.D. 96 where John dies. They would say that's what Revelation covers back there. The historist would say simply all centuries A.D. from the first to the second advent is just a big general picture. The idealist would say any time, none in particular. And the futurist would say... These events cover the very last century of the very last year, last year of the last century, A.D., when time stops and God's reign begins eternal. That's what I believe, that, that these events will be the last and final recordings of human history because what happens after the end of the book of Revelation is called eternity. Amen. 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 Where does, back to chapter 1, verse number 1. By the way, if you, if, you, if you have a different understanding of this, you are still my brother as long as you have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Amen. You, you're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. No need to be uncharitable. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. No need to be uncharitable. No need to be divisive. No need to be angry. Just charitable, and uh, we'll appreciate this as we walk through. So here's what I'd like what for you to do. As we walk through the book of Revelation, just like we did with when we studied the pre-reth rapture several years ago, just, let's just get through this thing for the next two or three years, and then we can argue about it. And everybody put up your right hand and say, I do solemnly swear to not argue till the next three years, or at least three and a half years at the midpoint. Okay, I'm just waiting to see. I'm just waiting to see where you were. Okay, just waiting to see. Back to Revelation chapter number one. Is everybody good with me tonight? We understand this. We're going to interpret the Bible literally where the Bible is literal. When the sense makes sense, don't make something else out of it. And there's just rules to that interpreting scripture. Those of you that got really weird ideas, it's because you are breaking grammatical rules and hermeneutic rules and, and making the scripture say something. So there's, there's rules to this, but we're not going to get into that tonight. Where does this gospel come from. We're going to call it a gospel in just a minute. This is the gospel. That's what many call it. Are you ready for this? It's often called the gospel of God. The gospel of God. The gospels are eyewitness accounts or recorded events of eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. 
Let's look in Revelation chapter number one, verse number one, and look at one little phrase. The revelation of Jesus Christ, would you read the next little phrase right there, begin, which God gave unto him. The Bible says that the revelation of Jesus Christ was given by God to Jesus. Jesus gave it then to an angel and the angel then gave it to John. Now, the truth of the matter is this talking about inspiration of Scripture and preservation of Scripture, we get into all of those. Most of the time when the Bible talks, talks about a, a, the Scriptures, they are, in, they are given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We've got a holy million of spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Is anybody with me on that right there? This is a unique way to say that a gospel was given. It was given by God to Jesus, from Jesus to an angel, and from an angel to John. It's a very unique, unique way of, 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 uh, of delivering the scriptures. And by the way, if anybody, if you ever hear of anybody that says they got a gospel from some angel, if you ever hear anybody that says anything like that, that's not true. That's right. Amen? amen. All right, there's no other gospel. Somebody say amen right there. It's given to John and from John to the seven churches. And I believe not only to the seven churches, but to all of us. So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of God. It's God saying, I want to say this about my son. And I want you to know what it is. What a special book. All of the book is special. Somebody say amen. But it's unique. It's unique. Jesus was very clear in his ministry that anything he said was not his own, but came from the Father. Go with me to the book of John. We're going to walk through the book of the actual book of John, the gospel of John. I want you to see some things tonight. I'll tell you what I'm going to do with our kids to keep them engaged this evening. I'm not going to tell you how many references we're going to look at, kids. But if you can come up to me afterwards and tell me how many references that I am, I'm, I'm going to walk through in the, in the book of John, I'll find something for you. And I know you may not like that, and if you don't want your kid to have it, that's fine. But we want our children, one of the reasons we got our Sunday schools on Wednesday nights is because we want our children in, sitting in the main service in the auditorium. We want them sitting in the Word of God. We want them hearing people pray. We want them to learn to pray. So we'll just find some wonderful ways to engage them throughout Scripture. And parents, you can do that as well. Somebody say amen right there. Look at me, John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. John chapter 3, verse 34 and 35. John chapter 3, verse 34 and 35. He that hath, let's read verse 33. He that hath received his testimony has said, has set his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. Meaning that Jesus is unlimited in the ministry of the spirit in his life. Amen. Amen. Uh, and uh, the father, verse 35, loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Goes me to John chapter number 5, verses 20 through 23. We just want to build this point that when Jesus spoke, he spoke in total harmony and submission with the will of the Father and with the revelation of the Father. John chapter number 5, verses 20 through 23. For the Father loveth the Son, showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. John chapter number 7. We're just going to walk through this really quick. Verse number 16. John seven sixteen. Jesus answered and said unto them, and said, 
said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. John chapter 8, verse number 28. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. John chapter 12, verse number 49. John chapter 12, verse number 49. For I have not spoken of myself... But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. John chapter 14, verse number 10. John chapter 14, verse number 10. This is the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it's given by the Father. John chapter 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Verse number, let's go to verse 24. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Two more, John chapter 16, verse number 15. John chapter 16, verse number 15. All things that the Father hath are mine, Therefore said I that he shall take a mine and show it unto you. And one more, John chapter 17, verse number 8. John chapter 17, verse number 8. I have given them the words. This is Jesus in his high priestly prayer for those, his disciples, and all who would believe after them. So this is for us. I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou did send me. And let's just read that first part of verse 9. I pray for them. How many of you are thankful that Jesus is praying for you? Hallelujah. Let's get back to Revelation chapter number 1. The point I want to make tonight is that we often skip over this, that this is the revelation or the gospel of God. This is what God is saying about his son. Jesus is not glorifying himself, although he could. He is God. The Holy Spirit, witnesses of Jesus Christ and the Father. Somebody give me an amen right there. But this is what God is saying about his son. I, get, I would think if anybody knows Jesus Christ, it would be God the Father. I and the Father are one. Are y'all with me? So what's the big deal? Because what you're about to see in the book of Revelation brings me to point number one tonight on why we study this book. Seven reasons why we should study this book. Seven reasons why we should study this book. And point number one is this. Revelation presents Jesus Christ in all of his glory. Amen. All of his glory. All of his glory. There, you'll never see another book of the Bible and all the books of the Bible are amazing. But you'll not see outside of Revelation anything. There are some things about Jesus you just only see in the book of Revelation. Only about him in these books. Why? Because the disciples and those who were around him saw what he did. But God the Father knows who he is. Amen. Only the disciples got to see a little bit of the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen? Peter said, let's build a church right here. I mean, right now. But God the Father, and it's so fitting that this is the last book of the Bible says, I'm going to show you who my son is. In the book of Revelation, it begins with the word the. That begins the text, but there is no the in the text. It, the word the, it's a, a revelation of Jesus Christ. Literally meaning this is, this is not some separate disjointed account of Jesus' life. This is a continuing story of the revelation of the Son of God. A revelation of Jesus Christ, a majestic, amazing, unique from all other revelation we have in the Bible. I want you to know tonight that you don't learn all there is to know about Jesus. We don't know all there is to know about God. We're limited in our capacity. Somebody say amen. Somebody said, can somebody give me a book with everything about God? We barely can get to 66 under our handle and you'd be having to carry more books than the world has. Amen. There's not enough cloud storage to contain all who Jesus Christ is. There's not enough pen or paper to contain all of who Jesus Christ is. So while this is a further revelation of Jesus Christ, it is not the exhaustive revelation of Jesus Christ because the exhaustive revelation of Jesus Christ will come when we see him as he is. So John is received from an angel from Jesus 
a revelation of God that says, there's a little bit more about my son, but you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till you see him coming in power and glory. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited about this. I can hardly see straight. And I haven't even had any Mountain Dew today. I believe we get a deeper knowledge of who Jesus is through the book of Revelation. What a shame that we have run from it. What a shame that we have not allowed it to be taught as it is, as it should be. What a shame that we have allowed others to steal the truth of the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the word apocalypsis, from which we might get a word what? Apocalypse. Now, when we say the word apocalypse, we're thinking of zombie movies and, and, and movies where the power grid got hit by the North Koreans and, or somebody and somebody did something and we're all out here eating grasshoppers and, and trying to survive and you think you're going to run for the hills and you're not. But the bottom line is this. We're, we'll survive. Man, we can't even heat our own ramen. Somebody say amen right there. We're in big trouble. But I want you to know when the Bible speaks of the apocalypse, it is not talking about some doomsday scenario. It is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The apocalypso, apocalypsis, whatever different forms of it, it means to unveil or to reveal. We, we think, oh, it's about the day of judgment and the plagues and the wrath and the, and, and the weird scorpions and the heat and trees dying and rivers being filled up with blood. And I want you to know that's part of the wrath of the Lamb. But the book is not about the Antichrist. The book is about the Christ. This term revelation is found 19 times in the New Testament as a verb and maybe 26 times. It means to reveal something. It's going to uncover, unveil. And what is, again, being uncovered in the book of Revelation that we haven't seen anywhere else? What is being told to us that we've not seen anywhere else? It is the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, please listen to this tonight, isn't about fearing what may come. It's about exalting who will come. It's not about reading the first two or three chapters like, oh, no, what are we going to do? What might come? It's not about what might come. It's about exalting who will come, Jesus Christ. There are more titles of Jesus Christ in Revelation than the rest of the Bible. 37 or 38 distincts who he is or what he does. 37 or 38 distinct. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. Or this is what he does. Can I give you maybe just a couple of those tonight? And we'll be on our merry way this evening. I want you to just to think about who Jesus Christ is, how he's being revealed in the scriptures. Number one in Revelation mentioned 28 times. He is the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God. Turn to Revelation chapter number five. Let's look right here. We're going to do a tour really quick, a flyover of the book of Revelation. So how many of you know if we're just now getting into the first three words of the book of Revelation, it's going to take us this long and uh, well, it's going to take us a little bit here. And uh, if we're still preaching and, you know, I'm, I keel over and I'm dead because I'm 117, when you boys pick it up and just go off with it. Amen. It'll be all right. Revelation chapter number five. Are you there? Would you say amen? Revelation chapter five. And I beheld, lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and set forth into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat up on the throne. And I love that. There's only one who can open the book. You know who's worthy of opening up the book? It is the Lamb of God. When we consider the lamb and the sacrifices, we might think of the Old Testament, but this is something for us to remember tonight, that for all of eternity, God is going to remind us that the reason that we are in his presence is because the lamb of God was slain to take away the sins of the world. Jesus still has the scar prints. There is a glorified man sitting at the right hand of the Father. His name is Jesus Christ. 
And to this moment, to this day, he still has piercings in his hands. He still has the scars of the crucifixion. And so while we're praising Jesus and while we're running through heaven and walking and leaping and praising God, somebody said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to high five Jesus. And I say, when we get to heaven, we're going to bow on our knees and say, thank you, Jesus, for the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. We're going to be with the Lord forever and forever. And God will never, ever, ever allow us to forget that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And what does John the Baptist say the very first time he announces Jesus when he sees him in John 1 and 29? Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Forever and forever we will be in heaven rejoicing, rejoicing over the fact that our sins have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. That he was the perfect sacrifice, the sinless sacrifice, the only one that God would accept, the only one who lived a sinless life, the only one who could have died and rose again, did for us Jesus Christ. He's the Lamb of God revealed throughout the book of Revelation. Turn me to Revelation chapter number one, verse number five. Revelation chapter one. Verse number five, let's look at just who Jesus is even in this first chapter. He's Jesus Christ. Look what the scripture says. One, he is the faithful witness. He is the first begotten of the dead. And he is the prince of the kings of the earth. Him to him that loved us and washed us from our sins and his own blood. Well, if you're looking for some ammo to praise the Lord and to thank the Lord for tonight, Revelation 1.5 is enough. He is Jesus Christ. He is a faithful witness. What does that mean? That what he says is true. He is a true representation of the Father. He is the first begotten of the dead. What does that mean? Well, there are people who died and Jesus brought back to life, but they died again. But only Jesus lived, died, rose again, never to die again. And that kind of eternal life he gives to those who call upon his name. First begotten from the dead means they've been literally born from the dead unto new life, unto eternal life. Those who are in Christ Jesus, your body may die. But listen, friend, you're going to die. You're going to die once, but you're going to live twice. And the fact that Jesus is alive today is proof that we will be alive someday after we die. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. Nobody, nobody runs Jesus. Jesus runs everybody. Hello? There's a whole lot of posturing today. World leaders, little tyrants, little people positioning themselves, trying to be the forefront of human peace and world peace and this and that. I want you to know they think they have a lot of power and they may have more than you and I, but they don't have more than Jesus. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. He'll set them up and he'll set them down. Go on with me to verse number eight. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Oh, there's so much in here. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. He's the whole alphabet. What is he saying? Anything to be said, it's Jesus. Jesus is the last and final word on everything. Who he is is who God is. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's got the final say. He's the author and the finisher of everything. All things start with him. All the things conclude in him. He is the one who runs history. The earth began. Jesus as the creator. He'll work this earth all over again. He'll make it new again. He is the alpha and the omega. He's the one with final authority over everything. He's everything there is to say. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the first word. He's the last word. He's the beginning and the end. Now go with me to chapter 1, verse number 17. Chapter 1, verse number 17. By the way, verse number 8. He is which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. 
That's from Isaiah and other, some other scriptures. This is equating truthfully that Jesus is eternal God. He was and is and is to come. Jesus didn't begin life on earth. But he began life on earth because he is the author of it. But he existed pre-incarnate. He is a pre-existing, he is the pre-existing king of kings and lord of lords. That's Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Amen. He wasn't a man who did well here and became an ascended. Oh, he ascended, but he did not ascend because he became Christ. He was the Christ. He is the Christ. And he always will be the Christ. Chapter 1, verse number 17. When I saw him... This is why I get little, I was telling our membership class this morning, I, I, I get little, when people write accounts that they went to heaven, seven minutes in heaven, 13 seconds in heaven, something like that. They say, I got up there and I bounced around, I saw a unicorn and the Holy Spirit was just haze and, and Jesus was there and what was he doing? Well, he was feeding grapes to so and so and when I saw him, I embraced him. Here's what John did. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. A little, we got a sound whisper over here. Is that coming through one of our speakers over there? Or is that just in my ear? Is it in my ear? A little bit, okay. I'm just hearing that right there. Let's go with me to Revelation chapter 3. Verse number 14. This is who Jesus is. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14. Unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the who? Amen. You know, amen isn't just for fun. Amen's a Bible word. Amen be, means I concur or I agree. It can also mean the end. Amen. Our kids know what the word amen means. They think it means it's time to eat. <laughs> you ever have when your little children finish the prayer for you because they were hungry? We have. Oh, Lord, thank you. Amen. We're not done yet. We still got to get in there. We got to hold off on that macaroni and cheese for just a minute here. We... Amen isn't just a bow where Jesus is the Amen. He's the final say. He is the agreement of God. He is everything who God is. He is the summation of all truth. He is the amen. Jesus Christ. He is also faithful, true witness, and he is the beginning of the creation of God. Look here. We owe it all to him because all things are by him, for him, and to him. Jesus is the creator. This is why we as a church don't play around and say that Jesus didn't create the earth or that this earth evolved. This earth did not evolve from anything. It's devolving into chaos, but it didn't start that way. It was created in perfection by Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. That's making it through our churches today that somehow that is a compatible view. And they say it's not a gospel issue. Yet as you read through the book of Revelation, you'll find that the very last message preached on this earth speaks of the God of creation. Amen. Let's go one more. Oh, let's go ten more. Revelation chapter 5. We won't go that many. Revelation chapter 5. Are you there? Would you say amen? amen. Revelation 5. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root uh, of David. What does that mean? That he is the fulfillment of God's covenant. He is the expression of God's covenant. When God told David, there will never be, a, there will, you'll always have a ruler. There will be a ruler to make sure and sit on that throne forever and ever. That's why we understand David is dead. Somebody say amen right there. He's dead and gone. But who is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant? It is Jesus Christ. And he will rule and reign. Why? Because God keeps his promises. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. Revelation 15, verse 3. Revelation 15, verse 3. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. I've often thought that Moses must have been a pretty good singer. 
I mean, that song has made it all the way from Exodus up to Revelation. I mean, I thought that was pretty good. And so anyway, he, he sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Who is he? Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways. Who is he? Thou king of who? Saints. He's the king of saints. He's the... He's not only the king of the princes of this world, but he's also the king of saints. He's almighty. Now, Revelation chapter 19. One of my favorite numbers, Revelation 19, 11. Some of you will catch that at some point. Revelation 19, are you there? Would you say amen? This might be the theme of Revelation And it might be the theme of the whole book of the Bible. Revelation chapter number 19, verse 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called, he's the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword and with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and of the wrath of the almighty. God. Verse number 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, would you read it out? Ready, begin. King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. The absolute supreme ruler. No one challenges him successfully. No one threatens him intimidates him, no one removes him from his throne, no one changes his word, no one deposes him, anyone who rises up against him will be ruled with a rod of iron, he will tread, pa- uh, tread on this earth and tread out the wrath of God and the wine press of God's wrath, he will punish evil, no one will run from him, no one will legislate from him, no one will unite together, put every single country with every single army, with every single Navy, Air Force, put them all together, put them in one spot. Jesus still comes out the victor. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There are 95 Greek manuscripts for the book of Revelation. 95 in existence. I'm not talking about things we've typed out and printed. There are 95 Greek manuscripts. Now they are copies of copies of copies. All 90, by the way, that's more than like Plato's works. So you can trust your Bible. Somebody say amen right there. Uh, That thing was written so long ago. I don't know if anybody. We have more manuscript evidence for the scripture than any other literary work in the world. All 95 Greek manuscripts have what's called unctual letters for this title. To set it apart even as you read the scriptures. Your Bible might be typefaced that way, where it's going in normal, and then off to the right, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It was used in those days for a term that could only fit one person, and everyone would know it only belonged to them. Here's what Revelation is telling us. There's no confusing who the real ruler is. His name is Jesus Christ. King of kings. Lord of lords. Rules and reigns. One more, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I love how the book of Revelation ends. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. But I want you to look at Revelation chapter 22. The promises of God's word are so precious. Amen. 
I won't ask you to show hands, but every once in a while, Satan will try to throw the seed of doubt in your mind about his God's word, about God's promises. It's not a sin to have that thought. It's a sin to keep it. You have to capture that thought, bring it in captivity, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But here's what happens to us. All of these headlines around us are louder many times than the Word of God to us. And it should never be that way. Here is an encouragement at the end of Revelation to obey what Jesus says in this book. Why? Now we can disagree on who they are, but there are people who die through the wrath of the Antichrist. He persecutes and kills, the Bible will say, the saints of the Most High. The, you'll read it. Some of them, saints of the Most High, die they love not their lives to the end, but they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. They died for their faith, but they still won. Amen. So just know there will be a group of people on this earth who experience persecution, tribulation, and they will die, but they don't lose. Amen. They're going to be obedient and faithful unto death. Why would they be faithful unto death rather than following everybody else who is going to take a little mark? And you say, people would never take a mark who wouldn't buy and sell. Yes, they would. They'd have done it four years ago. Yes, they would. If you'd have gone into Safeway five years ago and they said, if you don't get this stamp on your hand, you're not coming in and getting your Wheaties and toilet paper. People would have done it. Yes, they would. But there'll be a group of people who won't. And they might int intensely suffer intense, in fact, will suffer intense persecution. Why would they do that? Well, here's why. Revelation chapter 22. Why would you obey the scriptures? Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. What is he saying? I keep my promises. Amen. Obey me. Obey this word. If I can keep my covenant with David, I can keep my covenant with you. Amen. I am the bright and morning star. By the way, he is the bright and morning star. Satan is not the bright and morning star. Jesus is the bright and morning star. Amen. As we get through the book of Revelation, you're going to see intense persecution. You're going to see a lot of different things unfolding. And Jesus is saying, just obey, just trust me, follow me. No one who follows me loses at the end of the day. We will overcome through the blood of the Lamb. I can't wait to get into the rest of this book and maybe even through verse number one. Let's stand tonight and have a word of prayer. Lord, we come tonight with great anticipation Lord, you're going to come one day in power and glory. And we look forward to that day. But Lord, you're willing to give us, Heavenly Father, you're willing to give us a glimpse, a revelation of Jesus Christ through this book. Lord, my one prayer for my brothers and sisters in this room is the one prayer for me, myself, my family, as we walk through this study, for our children, for our teenagers, Lord, we may not remember sequences, we may not be able to remember references, but may we just come away with a greater love and awe for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
through the study of this book, through the walking through of this book, may we live with greater hope and anticipation, not in fear of what could happen or will happen, but in anticipation of the one who will come, the one who will come in clouds, the one who will come in power, the one who will come in glory, the one who will come conquering and ruling and reigning, Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. And we look forward, Lord Jesus, even so, Jesus, come quickly. And with John, we say, Amen and amen and amen. Jesus, you are the amen. You're the final word. Thank you for keeping your promise. We bless your name. And all God's people said, Amen. amen.